Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Norman Sandridge coming to you live from Silver Spring, Maryland, where it's uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I want to welcome everyone who is participating in the now uh, global worldwide conference on teaching leaders and leadership through classics. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about a uh, work of literature that is arguably not a classic, or at least not uh, an ancient classic. It's the children's book uh, called Puss in Boots uh, that I came across uh, a couple years ago when I was um, just reading bedtime stories to my daughter and I realized uh, how much uh, this work could actually be uh, used as a, as a teaching tool for uh, studying leadership. So what I want to do uh, today is kind of two things. I want to talk about this work as a, as a tool uh, for pedagogy, a uh, way of talking about leadership. And I also want to use it to, to talk about leadership, uh, specifically to raise questions uh, about an area of research that's very important to me, and that is um, psychopathic leadership or um, so-called so uh, emotionally impoverished uh, uh, leadership as opposed to uh, emotionally intelligent or emo emotionally nuanced or sophisticated leadership. So uh, just, just to begin, uh, this uh, work, Puss in Boots, is originally written uh, in the 16th century by uh, an Italian author named Giovanni uh, Francesco uh, Strapola, uh, and it's been retold uh, many times, and it's, been, it's building on uh, a long literary tradition uh, that, that goes back uh, thousands of years that involves uh, stories about uh, helper animals, uh, or what I want to focus on uh, here in particular, the idea of the, the trickster figure as a, uh, as a helper uh, or as a, an agent of change. We can think of the trickster figure uh, as a leader figure as well. Uh, and to me, what's, what's interesting about uh, using a story like this uh, for pedagogical purposes is it's a very uh, easy and simple way to begin a conversation with students about, uh, about leadership. Sometimes it's uh, tough to get students to read uh, a work that's 50 pages long or 100 pages long and you know full of names and details. And the nice thing about uh, folk tales or um, fables is that uh, they tend to be very short, they tend to be very simple, or at least simple on the surface. Uh, and then, and for that reason, they're they're very memorable. They're also sometimes uh, strange and wondrous. And uh, in my experience, when I've uh, read Puss in Boots to my students at times, uh, they will remember details of the story uh, a month later, two months later uh, into the class. So uh, as I say, it's a very good way of uh, framing conversations about leadership. And if you can just get students uh, to remember a story, um, you, you know, you're, you're kind of halfway toward building uh, the, the conversation. So uh, I, I strongly encourage thinking about doing that, thinking about using fables, or thinking about even just using uh, children's stories that might be uh, familiar um, to, uh, to your audience in, in some way or another. So um, yeah, anyway, uh, ha having said that, I, I want to read the story uh, very quickly. It's a, it's a short story, uh, not, uh, not very long at all. You can see that uh, it belonged to me when I was a little kid. That's still how I uh, sign my name, by the way. Um, and I'll read this uh, story to you. And by the way, the, the comments section is, is open on the live chat. So if anybody wants to, to chime in and um, share questions or thoughts, uh, I will be uh, checking it periodically. So please uh, feel free to, to share uh, anything that you come up with. So I'm going to read the story and then I'm going to point out uh, some places that I think um, you can have interesting conversations uh, about uh, leadership. So uh, here goes. Once upon a time, there was a miller who had three sons. He was so poor that when he died, he left nothing but his mill, his donkey, and his cat. The mill, of course, had to be left to his eldest son, the donkey. Uh, to his eldest son, the donkey went to his second son. Then all that was left for the youngest son was his father's cat. Alas, sighed the youngest son, Puss is no use to me, and I am too poor even to feed him. Here he is being sad, but uh, you can already tell the cat is going to do some amazing things. Uh, Don't worry, dear master, said the cat. Buy me a pair of boots, some clothes, and a bag, and you will find that we are not as badly off as you think. The miller's son was very surprised to hear a cat talk. Who wouldn't be? A cat that can talk is perhaps clever enough to do as he promises, he thought to himself. 
So with his last few coins, the miller's son bought Puss a pair of boots and a bag, some clothes, and a handsome plumed hat. Puss was delighted with his new outfit. He put it on and strutted up and down in front of his master. He looked so proud of himself that the miller's son could not help but laugh. From that time on, the miller's son always called his cat Puss in Boots. Then Puss slung the bag over his shoulder and went off to the garden. There he gathered some fresh lettuce leaves where he, which he put in his bag. Here he is in his finery. Next, Puss in Boots set off across the fields. He stopped when he came to a rabbit hole. Then leaving the mouth of his bag open, he lay quietly down nearby. A plump rabbit soon peeped out of the hole. It smelled the fresh lettuce leaves and came nearer. They were, they were too tempting. First, the rabbit's nose went into the bag and then its head. Puss quickly pulled the strings and the rabbit was caught. With the rabbit in his bag, Puss in Boots marched off to the palace and asked to see the king. When he was brought before him, he made a low bow and said, your majesty, please accept this rabbit as a gift from my lord, the Marquis of Carabas. The king was amused by his cat wearing boots and talking. Tell your master, he said, that I accept his gift and I am much obliged. As it happened, the king had a daughter who was said to be the most beautiful princess in the world. Now one day, Puss in Boots heard that the king and his daughter were going for a drive by the river. Puss ran immediately to the miller's son and said, my master, if you will now do as I tell you, your future will be made. <coughs> what will you have me do? Asked the miller's son. First, you must bathe here in the river, said the cat. Secondly, you must believe that you are not yourself, but the Marquis of Carabas. I have never heard of the Marquis of Carabas, said the miller's son, but I will do as you say. While the miller's son was bathing in the river, the royal carriages came into sight. The king was in his carriage with his daughter beside him. His nobles were riding behind. Suddenly they were startled by a cry of, help, help, my lord, the Marquis of Carabas is drowning. The king looked out of, looking out of his carriage saw Puss in Boots who was running beside the river. The king told his nobles to run quickly to the help of the drowning man. Puss ran back to the king as soon as the nobles had dragged his master from the river. Making a low bow, he said, your majesty, what shall my poor master do? For a thief has stolen his clothes. Now the truth was that Puss in Boots had hidden the clothes under a large stone. That is most unfortunate, said the king. We cannot leave him here without clothes. So he gave orders to a servant to fetch a suit from the palace. When the miller's son was dressed in a suit of good clothes, he looked very fine indeed. The king then invited him to go for a drive with him. So the miller's son sat in the carriage beside the princess. Puss ran on quickly ahead of the carriage. He stopped when he reached a meadow where the mowers were cutting the grass. There he is in his finery. Puss spoke to the mowers. The king is, the king is coming this way, and he may ask you whose meadow this is. Unless you say that it belongs to the Marquis of Carabas, you shall be chopped fine as mincemeat. The mowers were terrified to hear a cat talking in such a fierce voice. A few minutes later, the king drove by. Tell me, he asked, who owns this fine meadow? It belongs to the Marquis of Carabas, your majesty, replied the mowers. What a rich man he must be, and how handsome he looks said the king to himself as he looked at the miller's son. I do believe he would make a good husband for my daughter. Now the fields really belonged to an ogre and this ogre lived in a castle a little further on. Puss in Boots hurried along the road until he reached the castle. Then he knocked on the door which was opened by the ogre himself. Sir, said Puss, I am on a journey, and as I have often heard how wonderful you are, I have taken the liberty of calling to see you. The ogre was startled to hear a cat talking, yet he was pleased to learn that the cat had heard how wonderful he was. He immediately invited Puss into his castle. I have heard, said Puss, that you can change yourself into any animal you choose. That is true, replied the ogre, and he instantly changed himself into a lion. Puss got a terrible fright. He quickly scrambled to the top of a very high cupboard out of harm's way. At once, the ogre changed himself from a lion back into an ogre again, whereupon Puss jumped down. 
Sir, I must tell you that you frightened me, said Puss. Yet it could not be too difficult for you to change into a large animal like a lion. It would be even more wonderful if a huge ogre could change himself into a tiny animal. I suppose you could not have uh, change yourself a mouse. Could not, cried the ogre. I can change myself into anything I choose. You shall see. Immediately he became a little gray mouse, which scampered across the floor in front of Puss in Boots. With one spring, Puss pounced upon the mouse and gobbled it up. So there was an end to the ogre. <clears throat> By this time, the king's carriages were arriving at the castle. Puss in Boots, hearing the carriage wheels, ran to the gate. Bowing low, he said, Welcome, your majesty, to the castle of the Marquis of Carabas. What, my lord, cried the king, turning to the miller's son, does this castle belong to you? It is certainly one of the grandest in my whole kingdom. The miller's son did not speak, but gave his hand to the princess to help her from the carriage. They all entered the castle where they found a wonderful feast ready to be served. It had been prepared for, uh, it, had been, it had been prepared for the ogre, who ate as much as 20 men. The king and the princess, the nobles and the miller's son all sat down to the feast. Puss in Boots stood by the side of his master. When the feast was over, the king said to him, there is no one in the world I would rather have as my son-in-law. I now make you a prince. Then the prince said that there was no one in the world he would like so much for his wife as the princess. And the princess said there was no one in the world she would like so much for a husband as the prince. So the two were married and lived happily ever after in the ogre's castle. Puss in Boots was very happy living in the castle. He was always the greatest favorite with the king, the prince, and the princess. Never again had Puss to hunt for a meal. He lived till the end of his days contented and well cared for. There he is. All right. So, uh, as I say, uh, very uh, short, simple kind of story, but I think um, raises a whole lot of uh, interesting questions about uh, about uh, leadership, good leadership, bad leadership. Uh, let, let me say um, first, the, one of the most common ways of thinking about or processing the, um, the figure of Puss is that he is a trickster figure. Uh, and again, uh, the, the Puss in Boots story derives from the 16th century, but you can go back uh, to the ancient world and think about figures like Odysseus or Hermes or even uh, Prometheus as examples of early trickster figures. These are figures that, uh, in addition to doing what their name obviously says of playing tricks, they also, um, they, they tend to be shapeshifters, taking different forms, sometimes playing the role of the servant, sometimes playing the role of the master, um, you know, taking on disguises. Uh, the, these are figures that are often amoral in character. They don't uh, seem to notice when they uh, harm people, they don't seem to have problems uh, using people. Um, there's a really good book about the trickster figure uh, by Lewis Hyde called uh, Trickster Makes the World. And uh, Hyde there talks about how the trickster figure is kind of a uh, kind of a culture warrior uh, or a culture hero in the sense that the trickster figure is often responsible for uh, bringing in a, a new political order or often uh, being an inventor of some new device like a liar or uh, giving giving fire to humans. And in the case of uh, Puss in Boots, of course, it is a kind of new political order. He transforms uh, the lowliest of the Miller's sons uh, into a prince uh, who we know will eventually become a king. So that's, uh, that, that's how he, he works as a trickster figure. Um, you know, very, very charming, uh, very effective, uh, very clever, of course. Uh, but I w also want to talk about uh, ways in which we might uh, see him as a psychopath. Uh, and, I, and I see uh, we have a, a comment here. Uh, Puss's charms, uh, charisma makes the Miller's son trust him, even though uh, he's a prodigy. Why do we correlate charisma with uh, trustworthiness? Uh, that's a really good uh, question, and that actually uh, segues us uh, nicely to the discussion of uh, the, the psychopath or psychopathic leadership, because um, the psychopath is also a, uh, is also a figure 
uh, who is known uh, for, for being glib and having what's called uh, superficial charm. Um, I, I think uh, sort, sort of the essence of, of charm, uh, or I guess there are several essences of charm, but uh, the, the, the essence of charm might be uh, feeling um, reassured, feeling uh, familiar, feeling like you you know the person, feeling like the person uh, knows you, which again is uh, one of the, the features of psychopathy that we could talk about. Uh, the next comment says, everyone recognizes and then dismisses the fact that the cat is a freak and seems to project uh, what they want to be on puss. Yes, uh, so strange. There have been a lot of uh, interesting uh, reactions to uh, Puss in Boots uh, over the years and, and various uh, tellings uh, of this story, uh, some from uh, seeing him as completely an, an amoral figure to, uh, to actually seeing this story as, a, uh, as an example of uh, the, the, the value of diligence and ingenuity for overcoming one station and also the value of uh, dressing well, which is something uh, that there's a French version of this story from uh, the late 1700s by Charles uh, Perrault, uh, who, who uh, derives these lessons uh, from the story. And it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, that, that uh, we overlook, I think, in this story, some of uh, the, the more amoral or questionable features of, of Puss's behavior. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, now a little bit. And uh, please let me know if you have uh, further questions or lines of discussion you want uh, to go down. Uh, Puss is uh, is charming from the outset. Uh, the, the storyteller uh, says that uh, uh, when Puss puts on these clothes, uh, the, the Miller son can't help um, but laugh. But then uh, Puss immediately goes into uh, what in what is known in uh, the, psych the, the psychopathy literature as uh, impression management. Uh, in other words, uh, Puss has a, a story he wants to tell, a, a narrative that he wants to advance, where the young boy is the um, the, the son, or is, is, he's the he's the Marquis of Carabas, and he's going to uh, convince the uh, the king that that's what's going on. So he uh, he tricks the king, and then uh, you know ca catches the rabbit. And in other ver versions of the stories, he catches uh, some uh, some birds, I think, as well. And uh, then, of course, he comes up with the whole trick of uh, having the, the Miller's son uh, swim and supposedly have his clothes stolen. And uh, one of the places that I, uh, I wanted to focus on was the, the example of when, the, um, when Puss speaks to the mowers and tells them that they must um, claim that the, the fields belong to the Marquis of Carabas. And uh, th this, again, if, if, if you're just uh, immersed in the story and, and following along, can seem like a very uh, amusing uh, kind of trick by the, uh, by the cat that he gets these people to, um, uh, to make this false claim. But uh, this, this kind of behavior, again, in the, the psychopathy literature, is what is known as uh, instrumental aggression. In other words, uh, it, for Puss to succeed, he must actually intimidate the uh, the mowers into uh, telling the the false story, and so that's what he does. And he, he uses the phrase, you know, "I'm going to to grind you into to mincemeat," and that's uh, successful. Now, why th why this is called instrumental aggression is because it's a kind of aggression, uh, a kind of attack on someone uh, that is not in response to any uh, threat or, or attack from them, which is known as reactive aggression. In other words, we all uh, have the capacity to, uh, to feel reactive aggression when someone attacks us or when someone threatens us, uh, we ourselves uh, respond with, uh, uh, with aggression uh, to, to push them away. And, and sometimes we, we go too far, but that's a, that's a particular kind of aggression. Uh, instrumental aggression, as I say, is a, is a kind of aggression where uh, you are uh, you're using someone else's suffering, someone else's emotional suffering or physical suffering to get what you want. And so uh, that, that's an example. So telling the, the mowers that they have to tell this lie is an example of instrumental aggression. It's, it's also a, a glaring example of instrumental aggression when uh, Puss tricks the, uh, the ogre into, um, 
uh, turning himself into a mouse that Puss can then uh, choose to eat. Um, so it's, there, there's a, uh, an example of instrumental aggression, and at the same time, with, at least with the case of the, the mowers and maybe even the ogres, uh, the ogre himself, um, you, you could also describe this as a case of dehumanization in the sense that uh, the, the mowers are just seen as lowly peasants. They're, they're not capable of, you know, fully being in on the, the joke. Maybe everybody uh, to Puss is being uh, dehumanized because they can't be uh, dealt with in a, in a straightforward way. And there, there's a lot, um, we, we could talk at, at much greater length, there's a lot of interesting research on the ways in which um, uh, seeking power or having power causes you to dehumanize other people. It just tends to, to shut off the part of the brain that would cause you to feel for other people uh, or um, uh, see the world through their eyes uh, as, as you might if you weren't in a position of power. So again, this is uh, ties into leadership. And obviously the, uh, the objective that, that Puss is pursuing here is to, uh, to raise the status of the Miller's son. Uh, one, one other particular point I wanted to, to raise too about Puss's leadership, and again, it's a question uh, we, we could have about psychopathic leadership. And uh, I don't know if you, if you caught this in the story, but there's a moment when the king arrives at the palace and he uh, asks the, uh, the miller's son, is this your palace? And it's interesting that the, the storyteller says the miller's son did not speak but gave his hand to the princess to help her from the carriage. It seems like a pretty straightforward uh, example of, you know, the, the, the boy is just not going to commit to being part of this, uh, this trick or this ruse, and he's just going to conveniently kind of go along with, uh, with what Puss has orchestrated. Uh, and this, this, for me, raises a really interesting question about leadership, and that is the extent to which we either expect or we allow our leaders to do things that are morally questionable, like lie and kill and intimidate. Uh, do we allow leaders to do these things um, for our own benefit? Like we know that they're doing it to benefit us, but we don't want the, the blood guilt, as it were. We don't want the responsibility for having to do the ugly act, but we allow uh, a leader to do this, and this, going back to, to psychopathic leadership, this seems to be a role that psychopathic leaders are more than happy to play. They, they would uh, be the person to, to kill or lie uh, as needed. And uh, as I say, I think this uh, can, for us as followers of such leaders or followers of leaders who may find themselves in these circumstances, it can occasion for us uh, some deep thought about what, what do we want to allow to happen on our behalf or in our name uh, that, that, again, may, may be immoral? And are, 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 we, um, are, are we basically scapegoating our leaders uh, by avoiding the, the moral responsibility ourselves? And if that is the case, um, can, can we live with ourselves like this? Uh, or do we, want, do, do we need uh, the kind of leaders who will work for us in a way that, that hopefully makes it so that these moral compromises aren't uh, aren't part of part of leadership. It, it would be if, again if you were teaching this um, this work in a class, you you could um, you could invite your students to try to rewrite this story uh, in a way that still gets you you know what is hopefully an advancement in the Miller's son station. Uh, you know, it's an amazing transformation to go from the lowly Miller's son to be a king. Uh, is there a way to tell that story, even still maybe using a, a magical cat, uh, such that you, you you minimize or eliminate the, the psychopathic elements of instrumental aggression and uh, superficial charm and Im impression management and uh, uh, dehumanization and, and all of these uh, elements, um, you know, and, and, and so uh, I, I, I want to 
kind of conclude by uh, by stressing how uh, similar I think the the trickster figure, which is often again like a culture hero, somebody uh, that we tell stories about, that we celebrate, uh, how similar the trickster figure is to the psychopath. Uh, one, one way that I I didn't uh, emphasize as much is the this idea of being a uh, a chameleon-like figure. The, the the trickster figure changes form. Puss in Boots, of course, changes form by going from a, a normal cat to a fancily dressed cat, but he also plays both the role of the master when he's bossing people around and commanding people, and he also plays the role of the servant, and even when he's playing the role of the servant, he's still uh, he's still in control. And, and, and one of the, the terms that you often hear uh, a psychopath described by is the the word chameleon, uh, you know, a, a, a shapeshifter. And there's a very interesting uh, etymology uh, to this word. A chameleon uh, is it's an ancient Greek term, and it literally means uh, a lion let on, which is chamai, a, a lion on the ground. And I I myself had always thought of a chameleon as kind of a uh, uh, an animal that blended in to escape from uh, its um, predators to escape being prey. But uh, it turns out, uh, the, the in terms of the etymology, that the chameleon is blending in in order to be a predator. And so, uh, it's, as I say, it's interesting to think of the, the shape-shifting trickster figure uh, as, as a predator, which, which again, brings, brings that um, character right into the role of the, um, of the psychopath. So uh, I think, let me see. Uh, one, uh, oh, so one other question I wanted to, to think about as uh, by way of conclusion is the extent to which we uh, are still enacting a, a kind of trickster figure, psychopathic leader narrative in the modern world. Is this a narrative that still uh, charms us, that uh, impresses us. It, to me, one of the the best examples of the the modern trickster figure that elicits a lot of these same ambivalent ambivalences is uh, someone like Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, who obviously fulfills kind of the trickster figure role in that he introduced. He's he's a culture hero uh, to many people, uh, and he you know he introduces a technology and a mode of technology and also, you know, um, forms of entertainment even arguably uh, with Pixar, you, you, you could say, you know, very transformative figure in terms of uh, bringing in new civilization, bringing in new technology. Uh, but at the same time, he was someone uh, who was known to be cruel to others, known to be manipulative, uh, his, his form of impression management was uh, they called his reality distortion field. It was a uh, referencing uh, Star Trek. So he had this capacity also, uh, you know, very good at taking credit uh, for other people, always on top, uh, always maintained his uh, position of dominance. Um, so, so as I say, I, I think uh, a very ambivalent figure. And, and the question is, um, do, do those two sides of him, the the technological genius and the the culture hero side of him, uh, do that, does that have to go hand in hand with the more uh, psychopathic side, or is there a is there a way to be a culture hero uh, without uh, um, using people, manipulating people, being you know cold and cruel to people? So uh, for me, that that's the question I'm still uh, very much. Uh, wrestling with, and uh, I hope those of you who are watching will uh, will wrestle with it. And I look forward to uh, hearing your uh, feedback and responses. If you have any, uh, I'm, I'm going to sign off now. But if you have any more uh, questions in the chat, uh, we can certainly take them up. And uh, thank you for watching, and thank you uh, to all those who are uh, who contributed to this conference on teaching leaders and leadership through classics. Those who contributed to it, and those who are continuing to participate in it. I look forward to uh, delving into many more of the presentations uh, in the next uh, 10 days or so. So thank you.